From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome to this Cube Conversation. I'm in our Boston area studio and one of the things we always love to do is talk to startups and you know, really find out, you know, they're usually on the leading edge of helping customers, new technologies, uh, conquering challenges, and to that point, uh, we have the co-founder and CEO of N0, that is Ohad Meislish, and we brought along with him, he's got two of his investors, one of his advisors, uh, so sitting next to Maish, we have Ed Sim, who's the founder and managing partner of uh, Bold Start Ventures, and sitting next to him is Guy Pajarni, who is the founder of Sneak, uh, so now you know is the acronym for Sneak. If you didn't know that, uh, I know I'd heard about the company a couple of years before that, and uh, my understanding is, uh, you know, Guy, you're, you're the ones that uh, connected Ohad with uh, with Ed, who was the first investor. So, Guy, let, let's we'll, we'll talk to Ohad in a second, but tell us, <laughs> you know, how the conversation started and what what piqued your interest uh, about uh, what is now N Zero. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, so. It started with people. I mean, I think fundamentally, when you think about uh, about you know, technology and you think about startups, you know, it, you know, it needs to be an interesting market. It needs to be you know, a good idea, but it really first and foremost is about the people. So I've uh, I've known Ohad from actually some work that he's done uh, at Sneak uh, earlier on, uh, and was really impressed with just sort of his his sort of sharpness, you know, his uh, his uh, technical chops, you know, and uh, a lot of times it's like the the bias for feedback. And then when he presented uh, the the idea to me around kind of making infrastructure code easy, and I don't want to sort of steal his thunder, you know, uh, talking about it uh, and about you know kind of engaging with developers for it. Um, I thought that really, really, really resonated with me. You know, I think you know we'll we can probably dig into it some more. But you know, we live in a in a world in which more and more uh, activities, more and more decisions, uh, and really more effort is rolled onto developers. So you know, there there's a constant need for great solutions that make, on one hand, you know, make it easy for developers to to embrace these solutions. And on the other hand. Still, kind of allow the right kind of a, you know governance and controls, and I felt like infrastructure as code was was like a, a great space for that, right? You know, where we we ask developers to do more. There's a ton of value in developers doing more around controlling these infrastructure decisions, uh, but it's just too hard today. So, anyways, I kind of uh, I I like the skills, I like the idea, uh, and I pulled in uh, Ed, who I felt was kind of a natural uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, to kind of help you know with his experience with other startups that are. Uh, share a similar philosophy uh, to uh, to kind of help make this happen. Awesome, thank thank you, guys. So, Ohad, let let's let's throw it to you. G give us a little bit sure. about your background, your team. You know, infrastructure as a code is not a new term, so I, I guess would love you to kind of weave into it. You know, why now is it becoming more real, and, and why your solution is positioned uh, to help mm -hmm. the enterprise. Awesome. For first of all, thank you for for having me. It's really really exciting, and again, thank you for for the opportunity. Regarding your question, so my background is technical. I was maybe still am a geek. Started university at, at a young age, at the age of fourteen, in parallel to high school, and you know, started my career on, on technical roles very, very early. I have now like 20, 20 years of experience. This is my second startup and and third company. As I mentioned, my my previous company, a services company, provided services for for Sneak, and uh, we became friends, and uh, later on. Uh, partners, investors, and so on. And you know, we, we, we've seen a huge shift. We, we call the infrastructure as code as the third data center revolution. We look at the first one being virtualization about 20 years ago, led by VMware and, and, and Zen, ZenSource. The second, obviously, is the public cloud when companies started clicking buttons in order to get those compute resources. But now nobody is clicking those buttons anymore and instead writing, maintaining, and executing that code, that infrastructure as code. And as Guy mentioned, you know, it made it much more relevant for developers to influence the infrastructure decisions and not just the app decisions. With that, it came many challenges and opportunities around infrastructure as code management and automation, and that's where, uh, where we focus. All right, so Ed, you know, I, I'm sure like me, You've seen a number of companies, you know, try to climb this mountain and, and fall down and crash. So uh, I, I feel like five years ago, um, I would 
talk to a company and they say, oh, you know, we're going to help, you know, really help the enterprise enable developers who are networking for storage, you know, for security or anything like that. And it was like, oh, um, okay, good luck with that. And they just kind of crashed and burned or got acquired or did something like that. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, for, from our viewpoint, you know, we, we've seen for a long time that, that, that growth of developers and how important that is, but that gap between the enterprise and the developers feels like we're getting there. So, you know, it, it gets similar to what I asked Ohad, why now, why this group, uh, why the investment from your team? Yeah, so I'll echo Guy's comment about the people. Um, so first and, all, first and foremost, uh, I was fortunate enough to invest in Guy back uh, in his prior company before he started to sneak and then invest in sneak. And there are lots of elements of uh, M0 that remind me of Sneak. The idea, for example, that developers are doing more and that security is no longer a separate piece of developing. It's now embedded kind of in what uh, developers and teams are doing. And I felt like the opportunity was still there for infrastructure as code. How do you make developers more productive, but provide that control plane or governance that's centralized so that environments can easily be reproduced? And the thing that got me so excited was the idea that OHAD was going to tie kind of cloud costs um, from a proactive basis versus a, a reactive basis, meaning that once we know that your environments are up and running, you could actually automatically tag it and tie the uh, environment to the actual application. And to me, tying the business piece to the development piece uh, was a huge, huge opportunity that hasn't been tapped yet. And uh, so there are lots of elements of both sneak uh, uh, in M0, and uh, we're super excited to be invested in both. All right, so, uh, Ohad, maybe just step back for a second, give us some of the speeds and feeds. Uh, you, you read in your <laughs> blog post, $3.3 .3 million, uh, you know, of the, of the early investment, you know, how many people you have, you know, what is the stage of the product and customer acquisition and the like? <clears throat> sure, yeah, so we, we just launched our public beta and announced the funding a couple of months ago. Uh, led by uh, Volstart and another VC in Israel named, named Grove and 10 angel investors. Guy uh, is, is the greatest uh, investor among those uh, and so on. We, we have some others as well. And uh, now we have like 10 employees, nine in Israel, one in, uh, in New York City. I am relocating after this whole pandemic thing will uh, you know, get better. I'm moving to the Bay Area as soon as possible. So that's more or less the uh, status. And as I mentioned, we, we just launched our public beta. So we have our first few design partners and uh, early like private beta customers now starting to, to grow more. Yeah, uh, and, and how would you characterize what is the relationship between what you're doing and, and the public clouds? We understand, you know, in the early days, it was like, oh, well, cloud's going to be easy. Um, it's going to just be enable it. It has been a, you know, wonderful tool set uh, for developers, but you know, simple is definitely not how you know. I think anyone would describe the, the current state of environment. So you know, <clears throat> help help us give Ohad a little bit of, of what you're seeing there, and you know how how you deal with like some very large players and ecosystems. You know, uh, our customers are the, the same as the, the cloud uh, vendor uh, customers. Uh, the cloud the cloud vendors provide great value with the technical aspect, with infrastructure. But once you want to manage your organization, you want to empower your developers, you want to shift left some decisions. You know, APM did shift left for uh, performance. Snake is doing great shift left for security. I believe that we are doing similar things to, to cost, okay? And you know, the cloud, the cloud vendors are in charge of you being able to do some technical orchestration, but when do you need to tear down those resources? When do you understand that there is a problematic resource or environment and what exactly made, made it? What is the association? How you can prevent problematic deployments from even happening at first? So all of those management and automation and insight and tied back to your business logic and processes, that's where we fit. Yeah. And right. I, think, uh, uh, I think there's actually a lot of analogy, if I can chime in, on um, maybe an ownership aspect that happens in cloud. So we talk about cloud and oftentimes cloud uh, is interpreted as, a, as the, the technical aspect of it. So the fact that it, you know, it, it allows you to do a bunch of things in the cloud, right? You know, sort of renting someone else's hardware and then automating a lot of it. Uh, but what, what cloud also does, and that definitely represents what we do in security and I think applies here, is that it moves 
a lot of things that used to be IT responsibility being a part of the application. So a lot of decisions, including ones related to security and including ones related to cost around anywhere from provisioning of servers to you know, network access to when do you burst out and to the balancing of business value to, to the cost involved or the risk involved, uh, those are no longer done by a central IT organizations, but rather they're being done by developers day in and day out. Uh, and so I think that's really where the analogy really works with cloud is it's not so much, it, it, like clearly there's an aspect of that that is the, the technical piece of tracking how much does it cost in the on-demand surrounding of cloud, but there's a lot of the ownership change of the fact that the decisions that impact that are done by developers and they're not yet well equipped to have the insights, to have the tools to make the right decisions at the points in time. Yeah, no, th thank you, Guy. And yeah, absolutely, because you know, cloud is just one of the platforms you're living on. Uh, as, as you know well from Sneak, that, that uh, integration between what's happening in the platform, where open source fits into it, the various uh, you know, parts of the organization that are there. Uh, so you know, you've got some good background, I'm sure, uh, you know, helps that you're an advisor uh, to OHAD there to uh, help th sort through a little bit of some of those challenges. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, Ed, you know, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear just in general your viewpoint on, you know, how startups are doing at, you know, monetizing things in the era of, you know, you've got, you know, the massive players uh, like, like Amazon and, and, and Microsoft out there. Look, um, the enterprise pain is higher than ever right now. Every Fortune 500 is a tech company right now and they need engineers and they're hiring engineers. In fact, many of the largest Fortune 500s have more engineers than some of the tech companies. And developer productivity is number one front and center. And if you talk to CIOs, we just hosted a panel with the CIO of Guardian Life and the CPO of Priceline. They're all looking at how do I kind of automate my tool chain? How do I get things done faster? How do I do things more scalably? And then how do I coordinate processes amongst teams? And as Guy hit, hit upon and, and, and Ohad as well, it's not just security. You know, there's product design being embedded with developers. There's product management being embedded with developers. There's finance now, FinOps, right? If you're going to spend more and more in the cloud, how do you actually control that proactively before things happen versus after or months after that happens? So I think this is going to be a huge, huge opportunity on the FinOps side. And, you know, the final thing I would say is that winning the hearts and minds of developers to win the enterprise is a tried and true model. And I think it's going to be even more important uh, as we move forward in the next, um, you know, few years, to be honest with you. All right. So, Ohad, you know, I think Ed, Ed talked about it. The, the, those hearts and minds of developers absolutely are critical. Uh, when you look at the the tooling landscape out there, um, the, the challenge, of course, is there's so many tools out there. You know, there's platform battles. Um, there's developers that find certain things that they love, and then there's, oh wait, can I have a general purpose solution uh, that can help? Um, you talk about this being the third wave. You know, how does this kind of tie into or potentially replace some of the, you know, the last generation of automation tools? How do you, how do you see yourself getting into the accounts and, you know, growing your, uh, you know, developer base? It's, 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 I think I have a very simple answer because, you know, now enterprises have two options. You know, either they go with productivity, self-service, uh, or they go with governance, but they cannot have both. Okay, so if it's a, you know, they're, they're, they're smaller or they have less risks. So they go with the productivity and they take those risks, take that extra cost, take that potential damage that can happen. But more we see the case of, I cannot allow myself uh, this mess. So I have to block this velocity. I have to block those developers. They cannot just orchestrate cloud resources as they wish. They have to open tickets. They have to go through some uh, manual process of approval. Or we see more and more you know, companies that understand that there is a challenge. They build in-house N0 of a self-service combined with government solution, and they always struggle doing it well because it's not their core business. So once you see the opportunity of uh, you know, more and more customers doing a lot of investment in in-house solution that do the same thing, probably a good idea to, to do it you know, as a separate product. And also the fact that we have the visibility of different customers, we can, we will very early, but for later on, add some pattern recognition and know, notice what makes sense, what is problematic, and give those insights and more business logic back to the customers, which is impossible for them 
to do if they're only isolated on, on their cases. So us providing the same great solution to different companies, allowing them self-service combined with governance, and then additionally add those uh, smart insights later on. Yeah, I mean, I think what I, I love about what he said is that I don't think he even sort of said finance or, or cost of any time of those. So really, like you said, governance, right? And I think you, you can swap governance or you can swap the kind of the entity that's doing the governance for security, you know, for all of those. And that sounds just awfully familiar, you know, for, uh, for Sneak, uh, which really kind of begs the, you know, the, the, the answer to be, you know, to be the same. You know, it's uh, the, the, the reason that M zero's approach is, is sort of promising and that it would win against competition is that you know it tends to be that the competition or the people that are around are focused on the governance piece you know they're, they're focused on just sort of the the entity that is the controlling entity and i, I like to say you know that, that it's actually not about shift left it's about the, if you want to choose a direction it's going to be the sort of the top to bottom uh, so it's more about uh like these governance entities whether security or finance you know, they need to shift from, from a controlling mindset that is top down, that, you know, is like this dictatorship of sort of telling you what you should and shouldn't do to more of a bottom up uh, element and, and allowing, you know, the, the teams, the people kind of, you know, in the trenches, the people actually make these decisions to make correct decisions. Uh, and, and in this case, correct decisions from a, from a financial perspective. And then alongside that, the, the governing entity, they need to switch to being a supportive entity, an enabling entity. Uh, and, and I think that transition will happen across many aspects of, uh, of the sort of, of, of development, software development, and definitely anything that requires that type of governance from, from outside of the development process today, that needs to change. Yeah, to chime in and add to Guy's point, development is so important, it touches every aspect of an organization. So I almost think about it as almost like a collaborative workflow layer versus being reliant on kind of one control entity, right? Developers always want to move fast, uh, but you know, how do you kind of build that collaborative like Git-like workflow? And I think that uh, OHOT and M0 is providing that for environment um, and finance. Guy is doing it for security. Uh, and there's lots of other opportunities out there like privacy as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if um, finance folks start getting embedded with development at some point in time, just like security is, or design is, or product management is as well, because that is probably one of the highest costs around right now for many companies. And they're all trying to figure out how to stop the bleeding much earlier. Yeah, uh, it, there's been lots of discussion, of course, is you know, going beyond DevOps, you know, I think you know, FinOps is in there, OHA. Yeah. Uh, you, you have a favorite term that you've had from your advisors yet as to how you categorize what you're doing and any, any final words on kind of that, that organizational dynamic, which you know, we, we know so often it's, you know, the technology can be the easy part, it's you know, getting everybody in the org, you know, pulling in the same direction. Yeah, you know, I think I'm looking at it on maybe a physical metaphor or just an example. If, if you just enter a developer's room, uh, you might see a screen, a TV there, with some APM, uh, Datadog, New Relic metrics, and they care about, the developers care about performance, they know very early if they did something wrong. And now they see more and more, you know, in those dashboards in the, in the developer's rooms, things like Sneak to make sure you're not uh, putting any bad uh, open source package, which is, uh, you know, has a security vulnerability. What we believe is that now they don't have the right tools, the right product, that they can be part of the responsibility of cost. And that's like somebody else problem. In other rooms, you have those TVs, those screens that show what is the cost. And maybe only later on in a waterfall kind of way, you try to isolate a, a root cause analysis on, on what, what went wrong. But there is no good reason why those graphs of the cost uh, should be in the same rooms next to the APM and the SNICs and to prevent those as early as possible, and maybe to change the discussion uh, and build more trust between the developers that now seem not to care about the cost, because they used not to care like 10 years ago when we used to have, let's call CapEx Cloud, okay, the VMware, or even EC2 instances with the predicted uh, you know, pricing, that's, the, that's old school. Now you have auto-scaling Kubernetes, you have Lambda, those kind of things you pay per usage 
So the possibility for an engineer to know how much uh, their code is about to cost to the organization is very challenging now. If we tie it from the developer up to uh, you know, the, the financial operations, uh, we will provide better service and just better business value for our customer. Awesome. So final question I have for you, and Ohad, I'm going to have you go last uh, on this one, is you kind of painted the picture of where things are going to go. So give us what success looked like. You know, Ed, I'll start with you. You know, give us out, you know, to 12 to 24 months as to, you know, M0 and, and this wave as to, uh, you know, what, 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 is, uh, what should we be looking for? Um, success to me would be that every large enterprise uh, has this on their budget uh, line item as a must have. Uh, the market is still early and evolving right now, but I have no doubt in my mind it's going to happen. And as you hear about many large enterprises saying that we were in the second inning of cloud migration, now we're in the fourth, um, that is what success will be. And I, I know it's going to happen faster than we all thought. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the developer angle to it. Like I think success is really when, when you know, developers are you know, delighted, right? Or sort of they feel they're building better software by using you know, N0 and by factoring this aspect of quality uh, into, their, into their daily activities, right? You know, what I, and I think a lot of that comes down to ease of use, right? Like I, I kind of encourage, you know, folks to sort of try out, you know, the, the N0 and, and see the cost calculation. It's all about making it easy. So what excites me is really around that type of success where, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's so easy that it's embedded into their sort of daily activities and, uh, and, and and that they're they're happy. It's not a forced thing. It's something they've uh, they've uh, accepted and, and like having as part of of their software development process. <clears throat> I fully agree with both Ed and uh, and Guy, but I want to add on on a personal note that one of the reasons we started M Zero is because we saw developers quitting jobs at some places, and the reason for that was that they didn't give them self service. They didn't empower those developers. They were blocked by DevOps. They needed to open tickets to do trivial things. And that, that, this frustration you know, is you know, just a bigger motivation for us to solve. So we want to reduce this frustration. We want developers to be you know, happy and productive and do what they need to do and not getting blocked by, by others. So that's, I think, another way to, to look at it to make sure that those developers are really uh, making good use out of their time and going back home at the end of the day and feeling that they did what they're paid for and not for waiting for others to just allocate some cloud resources for them. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, uh, Ohad, want to wish you the best. Absolutely, some of the early uh, things that we've seen, you know, sometimes there, there are the tools that, you know, help, you know, we, we've been talking, you know, gosh, I, I think, 15, 20 years about breaking down the silos uh, between various parts of the organization. Some of the tools give you different viewpoints into what you're doing, uh, help have some of the connection and hopefully some empathy as to what the various pieces are there. Uh, you know, you really highlighted, you know, there, there's nothing worse than I'm not being appreciated for the work I'm doing uh, or, you know, they don't understand, you know, the challenges that I'm going through. So, yep. um, you know, congratulations on N0. We look forward to following going uh, forward and uh, definitely hope to talk to some of your customers in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, and, and Guy, really appreciate your, your, uh, your perspectives on this. Thank you for joining us also. Thanks for having me on. All right, be sure to check out thecube.net where you can find uh, all of the events we're doing online these days, of course, as well as a huge back catalog uh, of uh, uh, what we have in the thousands of interviews that we've done. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching theCUBE.